Happy Sabbath Church and welcome once again here to Anaheim Church. We want to welcome both our Orange and Anaheim Church families and those even watching online who are not part of the churches, we want to welcome you here again to this Sabbath here 
in our worship service. We want to also wish you a happy early Thanksgiving as next week is Thanksgiving and we hope that you enjoy that time with your friends and family. We do know that even though we were promised to meet today, that we were going to be here, the unfortunate news with what's going on in the news, we're not able to. But I'd like to remind you that, as scripture says, in a time of thanks, that regardless of what is happening, we have much to be thankful for, we have much that we can still rejoice in, and that no matter what happens, nothing can sever the ties of our relationship with Christ. Neither height nor depth nor any creature can separate us from the love of Jesus, and it is that that we can be thankful for. We have a couple of announcements for you this morning. The first is a reminder of our Sabbath schools. Our Sabbath school out at Orange is still continuing at 8 a.m. outside. But here at Anaheim, we have moved up by one hour. No, it's not daylight savings time. We have moved up one hour, the Sabbath school hour. So it is no longer at 9 a.m., it is at 10 a.m. And we will have our tents up there as well. As many of you know, we have the tents taken down, but they are back outside. So we will be having Sabbath school under those tents. Speaking of using those tents, we want a reminder to all of you that Dr. Maria's discipleship program is also starting up again today at Sabbath uh, from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. out there under the tents. We are moving outside because of all the rules that are going on, but we are still continuing that under the tents for the next eight weeks starting today at 1 p.m. until 3 p.m. We are excited for Orange Church because we are doing the annual toy drive. This toy drive is where we collect lots of goodies and gift cards and toys for kids ages 1 through 12 and we distribute them to the community. With such animosity in the world and society towards just life and sometimes even towards Christ and religion, this is a beautiful opportunity for us to give to those in need. And so if you find it in your heart to be able to do that, we ask that you go online or you go to stores or however you get those toys for boys and girls, go ahead and do that for ages 1 through 12 toys, gift cards, whatever they are, and have them sent to the Orange Church by December 5th. We would like if you could mail toys or uh, drop them off at the church or even mail those gift cards, we would love to be able to distribute those to those families in need. We thank you for joining us here and we ask that wherever you find yourself to remember that we have a reason to give thanks. Have a happy Sabbath. Good morning once again, dear church family. It is a pleasure and a joy to be with you, albeit here over the screen. We had thought we would be in the sanctuary, both for Orange and Anaheim churches uh, this week, but of course with the increased risk of COVID transmission, we are not, and we're sad for that. Maybe numerous things in society have been giving us stresses, giving us problems, giving us worries, but the Bible says we are to do something revolutionary. It says we are to give thanks in all circumstances. So we wanna dedicate our hearts to that today. Would you sing with me the beloved song, Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart? Give thanks.
Well, it is our time in our program in which we give the boys and girls a priority slot. Uh, Mom and Dad, if the uh, kids are in another room, we want to encourage you to call them over because this is a special time just for them. Hello, boys and girls. It's good to see you here over the screen. I have so missed seeing you in person, but I pray you're doing well. I know you guys are growing stronger, growing bigger every day. You've been having to do, a lot of you guys, probably some school over the screen, which is uh, kind of stinky. But uh, we're looking forward to Thanksgiving now. You probably have at least a few days off next week, if not the whole week. And today I want to sing a song for you that goes with a Bible verse from the book of Philippians. What book, kids? Philippians. I find Philippians such a blessing. Sometimes I say, I flip for Philippians. So Thanksgiving is a time of thankfulness. And we may not feel very thankful right now. So many things are closed. Some of my favorite restaurants are closed. Some of the parks I like to go to are closed. And all these different things. But the Bible actually tells us in Philippians chapter 4 to rejoice in the Lord. How often should we rejoice in the Lord? Once a week? A couple times? The Bible actually says rejoice in the Lord always. In every circumstance, always, Paul says, if you're not sure I meant what I said, I'll say it again, always. And so what we do, what we find is that we're actually not called to rejoice because of things that happen to us. It says rejoice not in things that happen to us, rejoice in the Lord. The Lord is on his throne. The Lord created everything good. The Lord is coming to take us to heaven. Nothing that happens to us, whether it's punishment or losing dessert or losing screen time, nothing can take that away. So we're going to sing a song that is a favorite based on that verse, Rejoice in the Lord Always. I want you to sing along with me. Let's try it. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Oh, now on that part, you need to clap. I can't clap because I'm playing the guitar. Maybe if I was an octopus, I could clap and play the guitar. But we really need you to clap twice. So when I say, and again I say rejoice, clap, clap. Okay, I want to hear you at home doing it. All right, grown-ups too. Clap. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Now this song is fun because you can make this song into a round. Do you think we can do a round between me here in the screen and you at home? So, you know, there's a low part and a high part. The low part is rejoice in the Lord always. And then the high part is rejoice, rejoice. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off and you start singing with me. And then I'm going to say to you, you go high. That means you go rejoice. And I'm going to do the low part again. And you're going to get to experience you singing high, me singing low, and then we'll switch. You go back to the low part when I go high. Does that sound okay? And don't forget to keep the clapping going. All right, let's do it. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You go high. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice, you go low. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, and again I say rejoice. You go high, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. I hope that was fun for you. I hope that brought you a little bit of joy. And as we're coming up to Thanksgiving time, try to count some blessings, some good things that we have, so that on Thanksgiving Day we can be thankful, rejoicing, as we're always called to be. God bless you, dear boys and girls. I certainly hope it's not too long before I see you again face to face.
Let us pray. Dear God, we are privileged to worship you, to read your word, to know, God, that we are your children by choice and that we are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. God, we are in a season of thanks. And what a reminder that we are to be thankful always to you in times of prayer, in our coming, in our going, in whatever situation we find ourselves. But especially in these days, when, God, we are reminded to give thanks. God, as we look around, we are, in some senses, we are, we are scraping to look for something to be thankful for. But, God, when we turn our eyes on Jesus, the things of the world fade. And we truly see, God, that we have numerous things to be thankful for. We are thankful that you are a good God. We are thankful, God, that you are in control of all that is. We are thankful and praise you, God, because you are the one who will see us through and you have already won the battle. We are thankful, God, that you give us the gift of your Holy Spirit to not just give us wisdom and insight and direction, but strength and power, humility, forgiveness, and yes, God, an understanding of who you are. As you remind us, God, that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that we may know the will of God. God, I ask that you will continue to remind us, God, of all these things that we have in you to be thankful for. We are also reminded, God, of the relationships that we have, the ones that you give to us in our children, in our parents, in our cousins, in our grandparents, and all those, God, that you have given to us. We thank you for that. God, we thank you for the privilege of having church family. God, we thank you because we don't walk this world alone. Because there are many in our congregations who are dealing with sickness. There are many even in Anaheim and Orange who know people who have COVID. And yet, God, we know by having this family that we are not alone. God, we have much to be thankful for. But God, may we never forget to be thankful or take for granted that we are still alive today. And we have a choice to continually choose you, to choose to be thankful, and to live a life as a light. God, we ask that as we go into this holiday season, God, that you would help us to not just look to satisfy self, but that we will look to serve. In whatever capacity that is, Lord, I ask even in these times of prayer that you would remind us to ask that question, Lord, how can we serve? Because you yourself, the Son of Man, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Lord, may we follow your model. And lastly, Father, I pray that you'll continually be with this service, that you'll be with Pastor Mark as he breaks the bread of life, that we will be nourished and strengthened and reminded, God, of all these things, of how good you are and what you have to say to us. We ask for your blessing and your anointing and that for you to shed your light once more on our minds and our hearts so that we can be more like you. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our scripture reading today is found in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 12 through 13. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. May the Lord add a blessing and anointing to the reading and to the hearing and to the doing of his word. Well, dear church members, here we are once again, worshiping virtually over the video screen. This is Thanksgiving week, and perhaps it almost caught you by surprise.
In a year that was already going to be difficult to be thankful, now with the news that we got this week, we have gotten another kind of a blow to our optimism. We are dealing with another disappointment. We thought that both the Orange and the Anaheim churches would be back in the sanctuary this Sabbath. And many of us likely had an ominous feeling that this might happen as we heard that COVID transmission numbers were going up nationwide and neighboring counties to our own. And if you are anything like me, you are feeling frustrated. I saw on too many news reports and even with my own eyes, gatherings which made me uncomfortable. The Lakers won! Party in the streets! The Dodgers won! Celebrate! Halloween time! Let's have a house party! Pretty big house party in my neighborhood a few weeks back. Hooray the election results! Or boo the election results! Let's demonstrate! And those of us trying to be careful were like, come on, you're running the risk of ruining it for the rest of us. And now the careful are, in a big way, paying the price for the uncareful. And it's not fair, and it's not just. And while the majority of us are just inconvenienced for a small percentage, small percentage of individuals, small percentage of families, the cost is devastating. But in a real sense, hasn't it always been so? Haven't the just always been praying the price for the unjust? Let's go back in our memories to one of the first stories in scriptures. If you have your Bible handy or a device, I invite you to open to Genesis chapter 4. One of the oldest stories, some of the oldest characters, Cain and Abel, the first brothers. What happened between them? You know where I'm going with this. The righteous Abel did things correctly. He provided an acceptable sacrifice in the Lord's sight. But Cain, who had acted unworthily, couldn't let it go, couldn't swallow his pride, couldn't try to do it again the right way. He slew his brother. The innocent one dies while the guilty one gets to continue to live. Think of another Old Testament story, Joseph and his brothers. Joseph might have rightly been called a pest or annoying in how he behaved, but by no means did he deserve what he got. Slavery into Egypt, a false accusation of a rape attempt. Again, the innocent pays the price for the actions of the guilty. He got sent on a detour in his life for more than a dozen years. Praise the Lord, though, he did not give up. He persevered, didn't give up on God, kept living the straight and narrow despite being entirely on his own, despite intense hardships and persecution. Now, the next story I'm going to bring up from the Old Testament is a major one, certainly more major than any of the hardships that we have experienced in our own lifetimes. In about 600 BC, the Israelites lost Solomon's splendorous temple. The Babylonians invaded, they robbed the temple, and they ended up destroying it and the nation of Israel. Now, Israel had been warned and cautioned by the prophets for many years, generations, that if Israel's kings and its people didn't repent, didn't return to what was right, that Israel would lose its temple and its homeland. But they kind of thought, nah, it can't happen to us. Look how God put us here. And they got lax. Obviously, Israel wasn't a monolith. There were many who strove to do right and encouraged others to follow God faithfully, zealously. But God's patience reached its limit. And the judgment that had long been prophesied came to pass. The vast majority of us have never lost our homes, much less lost our country, much less lost the visible center of our religion. We don't even know how it would feel because we don't have a physical center of our religion in the same way that the Jewish people did back in the BC years. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the devastation that the Israelites faced at the hands of the Babylonians was total. But my main question for you today is, what do the people of God do in the face of setbacks, of detours, of devastation that are not their own causing, not their own fault? 
You could possibly argue that they would be justified in throwing in the towel. Joseph in Egypt, I guess I'm giving up on all that. Or the Israelites going into Babylonian captivity, I guess the one God of heaven, he's either abandoned us or he never existed in the first place. Maybe they were just stories. But praise the Lord, they didn't. For the future of God's people depended on them and on their fidelity. In both cases, the Israelites were saved through Joseph's fidelity all those years back, and the true faith could go forward after the Babylonian captivity because of the faithfulness through that captivity. What we find in the narrative of the book of Daniel is incredible, remarkable. Though the temple is destroyed and the people exiled, there is an account of profound faithfulness on the part of God's people, profound faithfulness to God, despite the apparent desolation, abandonment, and God's continued faithfulness to the people, despite the huge derailing of the plan of his ideal. From the commitment to stick with God's health and religious principles, not defiling themselves with the luxurious delicacies of the king's court, to the three Hebrew young men who refused to bow down and worship an image made of gold, to Daniel refusing to stop praying openly when there was a decree against it at risk to his own life and limb. What examples of stick to despite huge devastation and loss? How would our account read if someone were reading our account hundreds of years later? The pandemic came, businesses, schools, and churches were closed, thousands of families faced sharp, sudden loss, and the people of God responded by... You can fill in the blank at this point. And I don't mean only fill in the blank, finish the sentence in your own heads right now. I mean you can fill in the blank by your actions today, next week, next month, and on into 2021. You choose how to respond and how to live day in, day out. We will look back on this year, 2020, in several years, and we will know how it turned out. Either the people of God faded, and crumpled and lost huge momentum because of discouragement through the pandemic. Or the people of God persevered, adapted, redoubled their efforts in personal spiritual disciplines and in relational outreach. Which would you rather be the subsequent chapter of your life, both individually and for the broader life of our churches? We look to the goal, we look to what can be, and we make the daily decisions based on that. Amen, church? We have the testimony of faithful ones who have gone in the past, despite huge hardships. We also have numerous examples in the New Testament of how the early Christian church persevered and succeeded despite repeated persecutions in different ways and different areas. The Apostle Paul writes something remarkable to the early Christians in Philippians chapter 4. He talks about expressing joy in all circumstances. Philippians 4.4 4 reads, Rejoice in the Lord always. 30% of the time, 60% of the time, 90% of the time, how often? All ways, in all circumstances. And Paul kind of says, if you think that this is a mistake or a typo, I will say it again. Rejoice! Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, supplication, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we have a choice, don't we, church? We have a choice how we respond. We can be upset, we can be anxious, we can be conspiratorial, but the Bible points us to a better response. Keep your rejoicing in the Lord, just as we talked about during the children's story here today, and be gentle and loving. Jesus was loving all the way to the cross, and we have no excuse. We, we suffer so much less than he does. And we have the opportunity, dear brothers and sisters, don't think of this as an obligation. Think of it as an opportunity to not be anxious, but to rather give it to the Lord 
It is his. It is his church. We have said probably with our lips hundreds of times, I am yours, Lord. Do with me what you will. And that doesn't change despite a hard pandemic. Now, did Paul really know what he was talking about? Was he just talking the talk here in writing this letter? Or did Paul walk the walk? He sang when he was chained up in prison. Do you remember that story? Do you remember how it ended? The jailer got converted to the gospel. Can people be converted seeing our joyfulness through the difficult circumstance? What would happen, what would have to happen in your heart to sing when wrongfully imprisoned? Man, imagine that. Amazing ending to that story. I recommend you read it again if you haven't done so lately. Acts chapter 16, I recommend it to you today. But that was just one episode. Paul had many, many hardships beyond this. In fact, there is a place in 2 Corinthians 11, when Paul was at the end of his life, in which he discusses all the hardships, all the sufferings, and all the trials. I read from 2 Corinthians 11, starting with verse 23. Paul says, I have been in prison frequently, I have been flogged severely, I have been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. They used to believe 40 lashes could kill a man, so the worst punishment to not kill someone is let's give them 39, 40 minus one. Verse 25, three times I've been beaten with rods, once I was pelted with stones, three times I was shipwrecked, I spent a night and a day on the open sea, I have been constantly on the move, I have been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, in danger from fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. I can tell you as a pastor that our concern and our prayers, and it's a real emotional thing in addition, in addition to whatever physical goes on. I hope your physical aspect doesn't come close to what Paul went through. But friends, if Paul could endure this, what are we called to endure? Paul is the same one who writes, and this was our scripture reading for today, from Philippians 4, 12, and 13. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret to being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Friends, <laughs> have we discovered the secret? And please be honest, I feel so far from this. You know, uh, these outside things happen and I get distressed. And for you too. But friends, could we be praying to God for this? For the stillness in our souls. That whatever happens externally, whatever buffets us, it does not unseat our cemented faith in God. God is on his throne. God will not be moved. And we have the opportunities, friends, to cement ourselves in a way that the outside buffets don't dislodge the core of who we are as faith believers, children of God. Friends, I want to urge you today to take inspiration from those who have gone before us, those who have endured trials much more intense than what we're facing. As the scripture says in, in Hebrews, turn your eyes to Jesus, the epitome of suffering unjustly, the innocent, again, paying the cost for the guilty. The Bible says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners that you do not grow weary and lose heart. Praise the Lord. We have these ones who have run the race before us. We are not the first to suffer. We're not the first to endure. We will not be the first ones to emerge victorious. In fact, the fact that they did means that we can. I can do all things, not in my own strength, but through Christ who strengthens me. Do we believe that today, church? Do we believe it for ourselves, individually, our family? Do we believe it corporately as a church community, as a body? I want to go on the record today, friends, stating that my confidence is in the Lord. It is His church more than it is ours. He will see to it that we will survive and succeed and persevere and thrive. He has purchased the church with His blood. 
He is coming back to get that which he has paid for. He has promised the church will endure until he comes again. Let him deal with the big stuff. You and me, let's simply remain faithful. Let's give God space to work. Space to work in our individual lives. Space to work in our corporate church life. He who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus promises. Matthew 24, 13. Another prophet, Zechariah, said this in 4, 6. It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Friends, is God's spirit limited at all by this circumstance? We have access to the same spirit who worked in Bible times. And finally, from the book of Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I want us to pray, church, that we can find a place, that we can orient our hearts, that we can get help from God, that we can give thanks in all circumstances. As Thursday approaches, let's be considering our blessings, that we may realize that they far outweigh the hardships, the limitations that we have. Can we do that, dear church? Can we let God be our God? I pray that we can. I know with God's Spirit we will weather this. We will come through stronger than before. To God be the glory for everything. May God bless you and comfort you this Sabbath day. And may you have a beautiful Thanksgiving despite exterior limitations. God bless you all. Our closing hymn today, which accompanies so perfectly our message, is about being centered, grounded in the Lord, no matter what happens to us from the outside. It's hymn number 530, It Is Well With My Soul. You may not be familiar with the story behind this hymn. It adds another layer, another dimension of meaning to it. We won't take the time to tell the story just now, but if you are not familiar with the story, I encourage you to look it up on the internet. The story of number 530, It Is Well With My Soul. Sing along with us. When
is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Thank you once again for joining us, dear church. Let's have a prayer of blessing as we finish our service. Dear Lord Jesus, how important and how much more important to commune with you, to communicate with you, to ask of you, to receive from you in these times of external hardship. Lord, I want to pray for every family and what they might be going through specifically. Many families have kids who are trying to study at home on a computer screen, not ideal for their learning or their social uh, aspect. I want to pray for those who have lost jobs or lost hours of jobs, Lord. They are really feeling the pain. They are full of angst as to when we can go back. I want to pray for the families who are suffering, dear Lord, for those who are battling COVID in their own bodies, for families who are facing loss, dear Heavenly Father, because of COVID. I want to pray for all those workers, dear Lord, day in, day out, healthcare workers in the hot zone, treating at risk to their own well-being and their families. Lord Jesus, we need you. I pray, if nothing else, that this pandemic helps our society realize we need something more than that which we build, than that which we set up for ourselves. We need you, dear Jesus. We need you in the long term to come and conquer and remake this world new without all the pestilences and problems and natural disasters. And we need you in the short term, dear Jesus. We need you to give us peace in our hearts and true hope, reason for optimism, dear Lord. Thank you that at any time, and particularly on the Sabbath, we can raise our eyes above this earthly horizon and look to the horizon you have set, an eternity and glory that cannot be robbed by absolutely anything. Please bless our church members, dear Lord, as we finish out the Sabbath hours and as we go into a new week. I pray that we can do so invigorated, filled, happy, calm, despite the outward storm. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm a creative producer at Nike's World Headquarters in Beaverton, Oregon. They can tell when a product is well when they've actually incorporated and tailored their products to the insights that they've heard versus just putting a product out there. God is someone who, the only person who actually knows the answers to everything, yet He will make the choice to communicate by asking questions to His children. Just getting home, walking through the door and hearing my little girl, you know, run up to me and say, Daddy, I love you. God is the ultimate in tailoring His love for us through the way that He speaks to us. I'm a steward because God engages me through listening.